Hi everyone, I'm Fiona um, and I'm going to give a quick update on the new European health data space and its accompanying regulation. Um, but before I start, I just thought I'd ask for a quick show of hands as to who has heard of this regulation before today. Hmm, maybe about a quarter, third? Um, okay, so um, we'll start with um, a bit of an overview. Um, it's still in draft form at the moment. Um, and then we'll look at some of the challenges in implementation and then finally look at how this compares with the situation in the UK uh, for access to health data. So what is the European Health Data Space or the EHDS? Um, well, it's both a digital infrastructure for electronic health data and it's a regulation um, governing the setup and use of that infrastructure. Um, its goal is to advance and harmonize digital health across all member states. So in terms of the types of data it covers, it's essentially health data um, that's in an electronic form. So that would include things like patients' electronic health records, um, data collected from clinical trials and biobanks, um, data from wellness apps, wearables and medical devices, and health data in patient registries. Um, the regulation will be governed by new digital health authorities or DHAs created in each member state. Um, and then there'll be an overarching European health data space board sitting above those DHAs. So very similar to the um, data protection authority and EDPB um, governing the GDPR. Now, the regulation addresses um, three main issues in EU member states. So first of all, primary uses of health data. Um, so this is data used in healthcare for actual patients. And the main focus here is on full interoperability and data portability so that patients can uh, take their data with them when they travel or move um, and healthcare providers can access what they need from different member states. Secondly, it focuses on data subject rights. So it's not always easy for data subjects to invoke their GDPR rights in relation to health data, but the EHDS will contain a central patient portal um, where they can enact these rights themselves. And then last, but by no means least, um, it will focus on secondary uses of health data. So that is policy making, scientific research and product development um, in the digital health industry. So item three um, is significant and is the most relevant for us here today. Um, and it basically introduces a permit scheme under which an applicant, so for example, an AI device manufacturer, can make a detailed data access request to a health data access body. So that's an, another new body um, in addition to the digital health authorities I mentioned earlier. So obviously being the EU, they love to throw in an extra public body where they can. Um, but there will be some prohibited uses for the health data. So this includes um, taking decisions which are detrimental for individuals, uh, marketing and tailoring insurance premiums. But importantly, um, commercial product development use is allowed. And there are two specific categories listed in the regulation that this can fall under. So first of all, development and innovation activities for products or services. And then secondly, training, testing and evaluating of algorithms, including in medical devices, AI systems and digital health applications. Um, as you might expect, access will only be given in closed, secure environments um, for specified purposes which fall under categories in the regulation. And the data provided to third parties will be either anonymized or pseudonymized. So we've got clear benefits here for both patients and industry. You know, for patients, they should get better health care, should be easier to engage their rights, and they should benefit from new innovations. Um, and for companies, they will hopefully get quicker, more efficient, more cost effective, and less complex ways of accessing data for product development and innovation. Um, and there should be a more level playing field. Um, so clearly, this is all really positive and something to be excited about. Um, so what could go wrong? So you might have been thinking, isn't a lot of this already covered by the GDPR, um, which of course covers all types of personal data, including health data. And yes, you'd be right. It is covered. Um, and so the regulation preamble confidently states that the proposal is designed in full compliance with the GDPR um, and it complements and strengthens GDPR rights rather than conflicting with them. However, um, there are numerous issues um, regarding potential clashes um, between the two regulations. So for a start, there are concepts that are similar, um, but different terms are used in the different regulations and it's not clear exactly how they overlap. So you have data controllers and data processors in the GDPR, but then you have data holders and data users in the EHDS. 
Um, and in July last year, the EDPB and the European Data Protection Supervisor adopted a joint opinion um, on the Commission's proposal in which they explained um, their serious concerns. Um, so in particular, there's a concern that data subject rights might be undermined by the lack of consistency. Um, there's also a lack of clarity about the role of DHAs versus DPAs. So if you as a data subject want to make a complaint about how your health data is handled, should you go to a DPA or should you go to a DHA? And which body should overrule if there's a disagreement? Um, no prizes for guessing who the EDPB thinks should take precedence. Um, and then there's also privacy risks relating to data collected from wellness apps and wearables. Um, so there is this prohibition on using the data in ways that are detrimental to data subjects, but there's still um, a concern that there's potential for unequal or unfair treatment based on profiling. And then lastly, um, there's insufficient linkage between the permitted uses of data under the regulation and then conditions under Article 9 of GDPR. Um, but leaving the GDPR aside, um, there's also the practical issue of needing to build this giant secure data hosting environment, um, which would obviously take a vast number of years. Um, and cybersecurity risk is also a key consideration. Um, and then there's the logistics of establishing all the new regulatory authorities. So a few things to think about before we get too excited by the proposal. Um, but what about the UK? So how does it compare? Um, so it won't have any involvement in the EHDS following Brexit, um, but the government is very keen to position itself as a world leader in scientific research, and we certainly have a lot of good rhetoric at the moment. Um, so for a start, um, we have the government's national data strategy, um, and that puts data for research at the forefront, um, and they recognise in that that new systems spanning private and public sector are needed, um, but they don't go into a great amount of detail about how they might provide for new infrastructure. Um, you then got the current draft Data Protection and Digital Information Bill, um, where the definition of scientific research has been enhanced to explicitly state that scientific research can include commercial purposes. Um, however, this is already covered to a certain extent in the GDPR recitals, um, so it's not a huge change. Um, and then more specifically focused on health data, um, we have the NHSX Strategy for Health and Social Care, persuasively titled Data Saves Lives. Um, so one area of focus is working with partners in the health tech sector to develop innovations. Um, however, again, this plan is mainly centred around providing guidance for organisations and providing open standards for interoperability. So it's not the kind of huge change envisaged by the EU. Um, but there are positives for the UK. Obviously, during the pandemic, we showed we are certainly very capable of mobilising health data when we need to. Um, and the NHS has long provided access to certain large anonymised data sets. Um, and organisations can also apply to use non-anonymised data sets, but um, I think a lot of um, organisations find the process quite confusing, um, and it can be fairly impenetrable to those without um, experience of the relevant systems, and sometimes those hurdles are just too high for smaller companies, um, particularly startups. Um, the good news is that the government does seem very aware of these issues, um, but we don't necessarily have concrete plans in place yet to address them. Um, so just in conclusion, uh, the current status of the EHDS is that it's being reviewed by the Council and the European Parliament, um, and they'll hopefully take on board the EDPB comments. Um, lots of parties are trying to influence the drafting, um, including industry lobby groups, uh, so do make sure that your voice is heard if this is something of interest to you. Um, and I think the takeaway point is that there's potentially um, a really great opportunity coming up in the EU for commercial companies that want to make use of health data, um, and actually, the, the delays caused by the GDPR um, alignment issues and the practical infrastructure just mean that you have plenty of time to get to grips with the regulation and make sure that you're poised, ready to take advantage as and when it does land. And in the meantime, we'll see if the UK can come up with um, something equally ambitious to match the current re rhetoric. Um, but as to who will win this data health space race, um, I'll leave you guys to debate that during drinks afterwards. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Hannah, who's going to talk about the convergence of competition law and data protection.